I actually almost forgot today, but then I remembered. It was a sign of something really grandly democratic in the soul of Gladstonbury's leading tradesmen that there never entered his head for a single second of doubt about the stuff of Wallops, all its young ladies and all its young gentlemen, being worthy of the second row of the select seats. It had, however, <clears throat> several times already entered the head of the Nietzschean young man, whose name was Bo Booty, that he was in a place of embarrassing honor, since just in front of him was the vacant chair reserved for the McKee, and to his right, for he was at the end of the row of his fellows, sat Mr. Stilly of the bank. In the third row of seats, but some distance from Sam, indeed just behind Mr. Silly's aged parents, <clears throat> were none others than Will, Zoyland, and Nell. Nell and her brother Dave on his right, on her right, and beyond Dave sat the vicar of St. Benignitus, the eloquent Dr. Sodbury, whose ministrations were so pleasing to Megan Gerd. Hmm. Don't remember that part. I remember the Nietzschean boy somehow, but I don't remember what his deal was. I just imagine him kind of like the goth girl in Daria. Um, Persephone Spear had been enrolled rather late in the proceedings among the players, but though so late a comer, she had been given a role second to none, having been called upon to play the part of the Virgin Mother. Hmm. It was only in the fourth row, just behind Will and Nell Zoyland, that seats had been reserved for the family of the mayor. Here Mrs. Gerd sat, between Cordelia and Mr. Bishop, the town clerk, for Carmi was to take the important role of the Lady of Shallot in the Arthurian part of the pageant. Next to the town clerk sat Mr. Mrs. Philip, and by Mrs. Philip's side was the curator of the Glastonbury's Museum. The fifth row of these reserved seats had been dedicated Mr. Tom Barter had been careful to see to this, to the servants of the leading families of the town and all the special friends and relations. In this row, therefore, there sat a most motley collection of persons, sweet-natured young girls, hypercritical spinsters, nervous old men, complacent old women, and a great many very riotous children. Here was Emma Sly, Louie and Lily Rogers, Sally Jones and her friend Tossie Stickles. This latter, because of her delicate state of health, armed with her mistress's oldest and largest scent bottles. Mrs. Bibby's latest two servants, Rose Nicker and Edith Bates. Some of whom, both of whom, had twice over given notice. Those formidable connoisseurs of mortal life, Mr. Weatherwax and Penny Pitches. Those garrulous supporters of the dignity of the church, Mrs. Robinson and Grandmother Cole, together with the whole robber band from the alley, Jackie, Nellie, Morgan, Sis, and Bert. The last names being planted by a devilish trick of chance just behind the curator of the museum, whose devotion to fossils was only rivaled by his maniacal hatred of children. At the extreme end of the sixth row, flanked by a voluble contingents of Germans from Berman and Lubeck, sat Mother Leg, with her faithful bodyguard, Young Tuesday, by her side, the old lady in her best black silk and the old man in a suit of cast-off broadcloth, hired from the laundryman, and formerly belonging to a Baptist minister. On the other side of Mrs. Log sat Blackie Morgan, between whom and the old procurer's but through and who and the old procurus a curious and quite unprofessional friendship had sprung up. Okay, you got all that? A lot of characters. Everybody in the whole damn Springfield. <clears throat> Mr. Geard had surprised both John and Barter by insisting on remaining completely independent of the whole thing. Independent of the actors, independent of the spectators, and the only indication he had given to his family of his presence, whereabouts, was a word he had casually dropped off after their early dinner about seeing how the performance looked from the top of the tour. 
The number of foreigners who were present surpassed even John's expectation, and they constantly increased. Crowds of them kept entering the field long after the performance had commenced. Every train that arrived brought more of them. <clears throat> they were French, German, Spanish, Bohemian, Dutch, Danish, Scandinavian, and Russian. There were even two oriental, long-haired monks from a monastery in the Caucasus. John Crow imagined these two men setting out on this westward instead of eastward pilgrimage at the very first hearing of its possibility, when two and a half months ago he had sent his announcements across Europe. The only person among of all this immense crowd who had bothered about trying to get into personal relations with the organizers of the event was a mysterious-looking priest from Constantinople who called himself Father Paleologue. It was this man to whom John, <coughs> when he found that he could speak English, had given a place by Mary's side in the front seats. At the opposite end of the sixth row, Romero, Mrs. Legg, and Blackie were seated, were all John's and Abel Twig. The ward matron who had brought them, a handsome bosom woman, always spoken of as Aunt Laura, was doing her best to amuse the two old men. In this task, she had was not assisted very much by her neighbor on the other side, who was an exceedingly caustic French journalist famous for his biting wit. This man, who had come to Glastonbury solely to report on the doings of Paul Caprinelli, was alternately scribbling in a notebook, what presumably were light touches of a local color suitable as a background for the great clown, and stretching his neck to catch more of the profile of Lady Rachel. Every now and then, he would turn a ferocious stare upon Abel Twig, who was seated between Aunt Laura and Old Jones. There was something about number one's sigeonomy, not to speak of his Sedgemore dialect, which which this critical person found peculiarly irritating. He was trying to catch every stray sentences, characteristics of English phlegm and English snobbishness, from the aristocracy in the front rows, among whom rumor had formed him was sitting the daughter of Lord P, who represented one of the oldest Ming Marcus Marquisates Marquisats in the kingdom, but number one's expression of wonder as to who had become of thick big flock of good southern downs, what old man Chinook used to turn into the hair field, were spoken so loudly that it was hard to hear anything else. I'd like to pause here for a moment to make recognition that we're halfway through the book. Yes, I made a note here. We're on page 560, and this book is uh, 1,120 pages long, which means we're halfway through. Halfway through. Can you believe it? Halfway through at last. Wow. So amazing. Ah. <sighs> Also, I'd like to mention this mime kind of reminds me of uh, Marceau Marceau, who I saw once in person, before he died, obviously. But enough about me. If the critic from Paris had desired to put down in his little book a really significant trait of the English character, he would have noted how respectfully and tactfully the brigade of Taunton constables called in by Philip kept themselves in the background. It was natural enough, perhaps, that the police sergeant responsible for this large body of tactful officers had chosen to confine their activity that afternoon to the outskirts of the crowd in the tour field, but such tragedy unfortunately played into the hands of the really formidable troublemakers. These were the revolutionary leaders of the strikers of the dye works. Led by Red Robinson, who since his rebuff of East, on Easter Monday had deserted the Pimrose path for blood and iron politics, the dye work strikers, with as many adherents as they could collect from the Wookery and Wells workshop, were even now at this very moment parading the streets with revolutionary banners. By means of a real inspiration of the genuine of eight, Red had made a bid for the nonconformance element among the populace of Glastonbury, and side by side with his political insignia, he had caused to be displayed at the end of this rapidly growing procession Inscriptions denouncing the mayor's pageant. Down with medievalism, these crafty scrolls read. Down with superstition. No lords, no lysu here. Down with religious mummery. Thus, 
While Philip's police force was protecting the morals of Glastonbury from the dangerous pieties of its mayor, these street rioters were lumping both capitalists and pietists together as joint enemies of the people. Up and down the streets tossed and swayed these varied and singular ensigns, gathering numbers as they went and collecting in the train all the roughest elements of the town. At last a cry arose, inspired by the airless breath of Red's genius for action. To the field! And the whole turbulent tide of people, the actual strikers far outnumbered by the less orderly elements, began pouring down Chickwell Street towards the scene of the performance. It soon began to spread, as Lily would put it, like wildfire, or as Penny would put it, like Satan's own stink, through the poor portions of the place that the town was up. <clears throat> like an animal organism that had taken an emetic, Glastonbury now disembogued from the obscurest recesses of its complex being all manner of queer chemical substances. Such substances, though they were living creatures, needed a shock like this cry, the town is up, to live, fling them forth from their profound hiding places. Most of the destitute people and drunken people and half-witted people who now poured forth from the most unexpected quarters were indigenous to this place. Thus, for the first time since the Battle of Sedgemoor, when that strange city, that strange cry went about the streets just as it was doing now, the town is up! The real people of Glasnevry emerged and asserted itself. The last time it had asserted itself was on behalf of that sweet, honeysuckle bastard, Monmouth, for it was the great gentleman, like Lord P's ancestor and Matt Decker's ancestor, who had brought Dutch William in, not the people. And before that, for it, allowed, it had allowed the abbot to persecute heretics, and it had allowed the king to murder the abbot without interfering. Ooh. It had responded to this cry, The town is up, when Jack Cade revolted against every privilege under the sun. It had rioted in honor of Mother Shipton, Jane Shore, Lambert Schinnell, John Whitcliffe, John Wesley, Lord George Gordon, and had even received and concealed from royal vengeance the crafty Welshman Owen Glendower. In fact, the ingrown, inbred, integrated people of Gladsonbury had raised their famous cry, The town is up, on behalf of every scandal that had worried the well-constituted authorities, since under the crazy Arvigus that had defined the gods for the sake of the blood of a mad demigod, and on behalf of the abductor Mordred had waylaid the lovely queen of Rex Arturus himself. These were the people who poured forth now on this historic midsummer day from Paradise and Bovey Town and Butts Close and Manor House Road to join with the strikers from Phillips Dye Works and with the holiday makers from Wookie Hole. So fantastical did some of these queer crowd look, who thus enlisted themselves under the banner of Red Robinson's Eight, that the German and French and Scandinavian visitors, not to speak of the monks from the monastery in the Caucasus and the super sophisticated Father Paleologue, would almost have been paradon for taking them as lineal descendants of the dwellers in the Abel Twigs Lake Village, which I do not recall at all. Abel Twigs. Who's Abel Twig and who's. What's the Lake Village? It sounds so familiar, but I don't remember. Oh well. Unfortunately, the Red's purpose. For Red's purpose, his impatience for action got himself and his strikers much too quickly upon the scene. His strikers were orderly and respectable Wessex workmen, not easy to excite to acts of violence. Thus, although before they reached the entrance they were shrewdly hustled by the strategic Red over several gaps in the hedge into the field and thus were enabled to approached the western flank and the ground crowd of spectators from an unexpected and unconventional quarter, things did not work out as he had hoped. 
If this heterogeneous mob of invaders had come en masse in one grand rush, there is no doubt they would have stampeded the players and ended Mr. Garrett's pageant. But Red's 8, directed equally against Mayor and Manufacturer, had, as number 2 would have put it, stampeded its wound self and ruined all its skillful strategy. He ought to have waited in Chilwick Street opposite St. Michael's Inn. And what a sight for Mad Bet that would have been! Until his ragged camp followers, descendants of the heroic populace who fought with scythes and bill hooks against a trained army and a great general, had all reached the spot. It was the lack of these irresponsible pilger licks that spoilt Red's plan. For his orderly strikers soon found themselves faced by the first five rows of seats occupied by the gentry of the town, and even the down with the mummery banners paused and wavered if they were not actually lowered before the indignant glances and the cries of order, order, that now arose from these seats. To the crowd they were followed these patient factory hands, such glances would have meant little. But many of these hands had come to labor in Philip Dye works from Bath and Yeovil and Taunton and Shepton Mallet, and they lacked the recklessness of the true Gladstonbury tradition. Too bad. Well, that's it. We're more than halfway there now. Isn't that exciting? Till next time, I'll see you in Gladstonbury. Cheers.